Welcome back to Creepy Confidential. I'm your host, Noelle, your resident weirdo Wisconsinite. I open case files on my favorite cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and other worldly creepy. Bringing you new cases, live broadcasts, local lore, and in season two, we bring you the cult of the month. So get ready, creeps. It's season two of Creepy Confidential. This is it, folks. The aliens are coming. We're being warned. The sirens are going off. It's time. Everybody get to your bunkers. If you have food, family, pets. Now's your time run. They're coming for us. September 12th, 1952. Braxton County, West Virginia, in a little town known as Flatwoods. A group of boys are playing football, enjoying the warm summer evening air. Suddenly, they see a bright light cross the sky and land in a farmer's property across the field. Ed and Fred May rush home to their mother, Kathleen, trying to explain what they had just seen. Mrs. May, not believing the young boys, went to her porch only to see a light pulsing from dim to light on the hill. The group of boys, Miss May, and a local National Guardsman named Eugene, all rushed to the Fisher farm to investigate. Armed with nothing more than a flashlight, the group heads to the top of the hill where Eugene sees a flashing red light. Pointing the light towards the site, he briefly notices a tall, human-like figure with a round red face. The face is surrounded by a pointed hood. A metallic-smelling mist surrounds them with a sulfur odor. Others in the party would later describe a hissing sound coming from the large object protruding from the ground. Fifteen feet away, towering over their head, was a vast shape. The face is round and blood-red. No nose or mouth, only the eyes from which project a greenish-orange beam of light. The beams of light pierced through the haze of the night surrounding the scene. Around the red face was a large hood that pointed upward resembling the ace of spades. Mrs. May sees clothing-like folds along the body and terrible claws where hands would be. No one was certain whether the shape rested on the ground or was floating. It's moving from place to place with a bobbing nature rather than walking. The retreat was swift and disordered back to the house. And with this single interaction began the legend of what has become the Flatwoods Monster. What's up, creeps? Welcome back. This week on the Cryptid Creep Show, we're talking about the Flatwoods Monster. Now, this cryptid is a little close to where we are in the neck of the woods, uh, just south of us in West Virginia. The story of this one is a little different. So usually cryptids are monsters, you know, I'll say monsters. This one is somewhat of a extraterrestrial presence. Uh, so I, I did not know about the Flatwoods monster actually until we moved out here. Uh, so I'm from, obviously, I'm from Wisconsin. We live in Ohio. Uh, I lived in Washington State for a long time. So out there you hear about the usuals. Um, but once we moved here, I was the first time I'd ever heard of the Flatwoods monster. Now the imagery of this one is quite different. It literally looks like a floating robot. And that's part of the theory, I guess. So a lot of people don't think that what we see is the monster, but rather it is a alien that's inside of this suit. So that's kind of mind blowing as it is, because all of us think of aliens as, you know, the greys, right? That's the first thing everybody thinks of, either the greys in a modern sense or the uh, quote unquote words, the little green men. That's another one that everybody, you know, that's what we think of when we think of aliens. So I dove into this one. I, again, as usual, I was like, tell me all the things. Now in my journey, again, if you guys have been listening, you know, I love collecting the rare books from these subjects, things that you can't just go and buy, or if you can, they're, they're republications of old books. So I found 
when I was actually diving into the Mothman subject, I discovered the Flatwoods Monster. Because when you when you when you're down there in that West Virginia area, you run into uh, pictures and people dressing like it and everything. So there's a book. Let me close my book here. Yes, it still has the original plastic on the cover. It's fantastic by uh, Gray Barker, and the title is. They knew too much about flying saucers. The true story of what happened to certain researchers and investigators who found out where the saucers come from. That's a mouthful. So this, on the front of it, I will post pictures of this book cover because it's really cool. Some people might have already seen it over on my personal Instagram page. Uh, but it has, uh, you know, it, what looks like the men in black, but it's these little shadows and then little flying saucers. It's really cool. So the very first part of it that this man who's investigating aliens goes into, the very first chapters, the two chapters, I'm, I'm turning the pages here, wait for it. The first one's called A Hilltop, West Virginia, and chapter two is called Flatwoods, West Virginia. So it was like this book was meant for me to get. Now I found this puppy um, online and I got it shipped to me not knowing that it was a first publication and it's from 1956. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> so going through this, I really enjoyed the, I'll say recounting of the story. I know you guys are listening to me crinkle here through the story and it's, it's so interesting. So they talk about kind of what's going on in this in the country as it is and then what's happening within Flatwoods. Now, there's many names for the Flatwoods monster. They also call um call it Braxy, um the Braxton County monster is another one. And inevitably, there wasn't a lot of sightings. It's not like Bigfoot where I swear everybody sees Bigfoot, you know, all the time. You're out in the woods, hiking, camping, fishing, somebody sees Bigfoot. There's not a whole lot of famous encounters. There's this one, and then 24 hours later, there is a couple that's driving in a car, and it stalls, uh, and they are approached by this alien-type figure. But for what they describe, it's as if the alien only has the bottom half of its suit on and it takes its bare hand touches the car and manages to you know burn or acid away the paint all the way down to the primer now they don't see the red face hooded figure per se they see the bottom half but that it's floating and it kind of has the same mo which is just crazy so a big thing that that is happening during the time of this first encounter, you have to remember, we just got done um, with World War II, with those types of bombs. There's hysterical, uh, you know, I say people are still afraid. They're, they're still in that heightened sense of, are we at war? Are we going to be bombed? Um, so I think there's kind of that hysteria part that's still going on. Not necessarily directed at aliens, but that 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 anxiety is still worldwide, still countrywide specifically. And this one, it just seems to make it worse. Now, this sighting also predates Mothman. So, but Mothman they feel is a creature, is not an alien. But same state. It seems like a lot of these sightings seems you know seem to happen within this small little area of the country. And, you know, is it because there's, I don't know, is there something that's special within this area that we don't know about? I mean, you got to remember, you drive into the back country of any of these kind of southern Midwest states, there's nothing. It's just woods. It's not like New York City everywhere, you know, or lots of cities. It's, it's parts of the country that it's too cold for lots of crazy things to live in certain times of the year. And a lot of it is either farming country or abandoned farming country or back in the day, that's exactly what it was. So I feel that when you have, you know, everyone that's already feeling slightly heightened and then you start 
they're, they're already fearful. And then you add in this alien type of thing. And this is when flying saucers, space age became super popular. I mean, this is when you saw movies about aliens, Martians, uh, flying saucers, the cars became space age. Uh, all the, the pinups from that time are, you see a lot of them when they're in the cute little space suits or they have the little ray guns and it was, it was all part of the culture. So it's not like they hadn't seen it before, but it was really starting to get popular. So I have a, you know, it's kind of a weird meld between what can make you, oh, <laughs> I'm going to leave this in. Can you hear what just started? It sounded like an air raid and I'm not going to lie. I kind of freaked out for a second. <laughs> so here in the Midwest on Wednesdays, <laughs> where I am, they do the air raid sound. All right, so we're back now that the air raid is over. So let's talk about this, this whole thing about what happened. Now, in Braxton County, West Virginia, you can, you can look around and you can tell that, you know, these people have lived there their whole lives. It's not like they've been exposed to all these fantastical things where they could have thought of something or enough where everybody's story matches. So that's part of it too. I just don't understand is that how can you get an adult, all the kids and a national guardsman all to have the same story and to keep it straight at the same time, which is bananas. Now, some investigators uh, think that the light that they saw was a meteor and that the creature with the eyes was a barn owl, you know, part perched on a tree. And the, the perched owl, if you do look at a barn owl, they do have that kind of smooth, I could say that pointed look. But again, they wanted to blame a, I think they blamed a bird. Yeah, they blamed a crane for Mothman. And now they're blaming an owl for the alien. I just, I, it's too easy that they all saw the same thing. There's no way it was an owl. I'm sorry. I believe it. I'm going to go with it. I believe it. Now with this appearance, there's a few extra tidbits of information. The first one is the odor. So the odor they say is a metallic sulfur like smell. Now this could be from many different things, but in the middle of the woods, why would it be out in the middle of the woods? And you know, is this some sort of, you know, when metal gets too hot, that kind of thing. Now, the next part is the hissing sound. Now, I related this to like a bus you know, or a, a large semi. They have those brakes that are run on air. So what if this creature was moving around and that's what you're hearing when you hear that psh, and they're moving and that they kind of go forward and that's what controls the movement. So that's not that crazy. It also could be, again, living in the same house that this is an extraterrestrial being in a mechanical suit that is out there trying to figure out why they crashed into West Virginia. Another part is the oil. Now, Mrs. May says that she got oil on her dress, that it had like an oil-like discharge, which again, there we are. Mechanical things, gears, uh, when you uh, pressure, things like that. If it was broken, well, yeah, it makes sense. You know, you sprung a leak in your hydraulics, that's going to happen. So also part. And then the last little tidbit was that they apparently felt very queasy afterwards. Now, if you follow extraterrestrial readings and things like that, people that have had an extraterrestrial experience will often experience extreme nausea following that whole ordeal. And that's what happened. It all makes sense. It makes sense that this is an alien and not a monster. Well, you're, they call it a monster, but like a, you know, a mammal, a mammal being that this is, that is from outer space. But the fact that the ship is gone and it's gone, well, yeah, it probably figured out how the heck to get out of there. And then Bob's your uncle, it's gone. That's not that hard to believe. There's so many questions. Why haven't we seen them again? Where did they go? I mean, I don't blame them for not coming back, to be completely honest. I mean, this is, have you looked around lately? 
people are nuts. People are awful. So I don't entirely blame them. There's a, a very interesting documentary. Now, it's kind of low budget, so you have to keep that in mind. But it's got a lot of really cool things, a lot of interviews with Ed and Fred. The Flatwoods Monster, A Legacy of Fear. I thought that was actually a pretty good little film. And I like that in there, when they were talking to the brothers, but the two brothers, they, they almost don't want to talk about it anymore because people have changed the stories. They talked about how uh, you know, some parts that were added to the story was there was also a dog, which is true, but that the dog fled and died right after. And he said, you know, the, the brother was like, no, we, we went on to do many more things with, with that dog. And it's, it kind of got sick of the fact that it kept changing. He knows exactly what happens. He was very afraid at the time. You know, they were young kids. And, you know, now they're, they're, that's, that's part of the legacy is that, is that they are now part of that Braxton County Flatwoods monster legacy. And they just don't like that, how it's changed and how people had the misconception that they were in it for the money and all this other stuff. So that is a very interesting documentary if you want to read about this. Some people think that it's another mass hysteria kind of thing. Now, while this isn't a group of a hundred people, it's a group of people. And it's one of those things where someone can, if someone's afraid, then the other person's going to just mentally go, well, why are they afraid? And then instantly now they're both afraid. And then it spreads and spreads and spreads. So people do often speculate that that's part of it. You know, especially little kids, they're more, uh, you know, susceptible to people telling them, you know, well, you should be afraid. And now they're, because they listen, you know, they, they look in other people, um, you know, and adults, adults are like, how do, can I put that? Where, you know, they, they want to believe. They, they, but they're also trying to protect themselves. Now, there was a gentleman uh, that he arrived about a half an hour uh, after the incident named A. Lee Stewart Jr. And he was the co-editor of the Braxton Democrat. Now, he found these people uh, receiving first aid, you know, basically from what had just happened. Um, most of them, as he said, quote, appeared too greatly terrified to talk coherently. So, I mean, these people were really shook up, even though they they needed to talk about it and they needed to tell people what they had seen at, at this time. They were they were still really shook up about it. Now, after he had enough of the kind of enough of the story put together, he finally got uh, one of them to accompany him up to the hilltop. And of course, like other people who were skeptical of what was happening, he saw nothing, he heard nothing, and he thought to himself, well, gases can dissipate into the air, for either higher or lower, depending on the gas. And then he thought this gas could have settled. And he bent to the ground and he could smell a pungent odor. He described it as irritating and it constricted his nasal passages. Now, this guy was a Air Force veteran. He had been around things like this, uh, but you know, general warfare gases. But he had said he had never smelled anything like this before. Now, the next day when this gentleman went back early in the morning before anybody else could get out there, but when the sunlight had come, he was looking at the site and he noticed there were skid marks. Could this have been from an alien ship? I think so. But I'm sure the other people are going to go, well, anything could have been out there. But alas, he did find skid marks on the ground where they said that this craft had been. Now, now finding this information, he wanted to check that theory with any acquaintances that could potentially go against that to try and debunk what he had found. Now, he did find uh, Brooks Fisher, who owned the farm. Uh, he had said that he had harvested hay at that location um, and that he had used a tractor. But now, when did you use the tractor? That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> Was it yesterday? Was it a week before? If you said, well, we did it last summer or last spring, well, then I doubt that's what it was. So they dove into it farther. And so it turns out this tractor would not have been able to get out where those skid marks were because it was too rough and steep for this tractor to go. So while they tried to debunk it and the farmer wanted to say it was that from his tractor, the tractor could not get there. It was too rough and too steep. Another way to debunk it was that this could have been a deer or a buck. 
uh, in the area. Again, where they go back with trying to debunk it with wildlife. However, uh, there was no no foxfire in the area, and a gentleman named Stewart, who hunted deer uh, with a bow and arrow in that area, uh, he asserted that the deer would have been extremely unlikely at this particular location. Now, Miss May had been called to New York uh, to give an account of what had happened to her. Now, in New York, she had talked to scientists, uh, and they had convinced her that the monster was a rocket ship, right? Now, this sounds like typical kind of big brother stuff. Uh, she was hesitant, and that's how I kind of read. She didn't want to, to complete the viewpoint of the story to the person, you know, the interviewer. And, and, and this is where I like this. Someone, quote, from the government had asked her not to give out information to anybody. Tell me why the government is telling somebody, don't give up information about this story. Sure, you don't want to further add to any mass hysteria that there could be involving that time. However, it's like an MIB situation without a real MIB showing up at your door. So I found another little interesting piece, again, while from this uh, same kind of research. Now, Mrs. May, right? Again, she's the oldest one that went out there. She's an adult. From then on, it was Eugene, and he was, I think, an older teenager, 17, 18. And everybody under that was like kids, kids, kids. So this gentleman who wrote this book uh, tried to go to the home and have an opportunity uh, to visit Miss May. Now, Miss May uh, had received a letter from the government which explained all this phenomenon and advised that a re this report was going to be released to the public, and then after that, then she could talk about it. So basically, they were doing some crowd control, some damage control, and figuring out, hey, we need to figure out what we're gonna what we're gonna tell everybody about this. Now, the release date came, it went, uh, so on and so forth, and he, you know, was told you're you're free to tell the the story, but you need to tell them that the monster was a government rocket ship propelled by an ammonia-like hydrazine and nit nitric acid. So following this spoon-fed response, you know, that this is, this is the rocket ship, this is the propellant, that's why it smelled that way, the Collier's Magazine did a publicity release uh, in the issue uh, October 18. Uh, was to contain the story of how this moon rocket uh, would be constructed in the future. And it had the photo uh, was the artwork, which was to appear on the cover. Now, the release date for the press was during that week, um, and he had shown the picture of the May family uh, because there was some resemblance between the rocket ship art and the descriptions of the monster, of course. Uh, and then, so this release went up. And it explained how the rocket ships, get, you know, it's going to do this and that and how it's propelled and how it has a ammonia-like uh, propellant. And so this just really it just kind of made these wild rumors go crazy because it looks like a cover-up. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. It's an alien. <laughs> I just couldn't get that. It's crazy. So, of course, time went by and it kind of lulled out. You know, the 50s went on, aliens were big, and it just, it always became something in this small little town that they were known for. They were known for the Flatwoods Monster. They now have a Flatwoods Monster Museum. They have where you can go, uh, the mural, they have like a Flatwoods Monster mural. And they've constructed these uh, large chairs that basically uh, Braxy, the, the monster, could have sat, could sit in. That's, it's kind of wild. And I found another book that's actually really good. It's called the UFO Hotspot Compendium. And it has all these areas that you can go visit uh, for aliens. Now, what's cool is that the Flatwoods Monster is actually in this book. Now, something cool uh, but that's within this book, I'm just going to read from the book. Check out the five chairs of the Flatwoods Monster. Uh, it says, I suggest that you start with a chair A, which is located next to the kiosk featuring information on the monster and chairs. And then they talk about the Flatwoods Monster Museum, which I can't wait to go to, the billboard, of course, and then the documentary that I mentioned. So those are all really cool things. I, I think it's interesting. 
And I also think it's interesting because it's a cryptid that is actually an alien, but still manages to get in the category of cryptid. So next time, if you get a chance uh, at the Flatwoods area, take a look. You know, go look for the Flatwoods monster. Look for some aliens. Let's see what we can find. Because you know that Braxy's got to be out there. I mean, where'd you go, man? (laughs) So that concludes uh, my discussion here on the Flatwoods monster. I will post up on our Creepy Confidential Instagram uh, the cover of those two books I talked about. They're really, really good. Uh, You can get reprints of that. uh, They knew too much about flying saucers if you're into aliens. You can purchase a reprint of that. Uh, It's it's interesting. Yeah, I really, I'm really enjoying it. I've only covered the first couple chapters and it's a very interesting book. Um, we're going to continue on this kind of line of thought of aliens. So we covered our heaven's gate for the first one. We're covering, of course, the Flatwoods monster, which is an alien. And then next episode, we're going to be covering Barney and Betty, um, which if anybody knows, they were kind of the big first publicized alien abduction and I am really excited to bring that to you and it's all I love how all these are kind of um you know these old school alien things are are right around the same time 50s 60s uh that was that Mothman Flatwoods Barney and Betty so very interesting uh please give us a follow if you can on Instagram please subscribe here on YouTube we're going to put up our episode on the usuals so spotify audible wherever you like to listen to your podcast and i hope you guys have a fantastic day and please don't get abducted by aliens